Today we have a busy day. We are going to be chopping and dropping in a raised bed. We're going to be planting some hardneck garlic. And also I've got a ton of starts in my greenhouse that really need somewhere to go. So we're gonna try to plant as much as we can today. Take a look at this. We've got a whole shelf here of seedlings and they're looking really good. So let's take a look around the garden. I actually had two frosts back to back yesterday and the day before. It's very cold in the morning. I think it got down to, actually, let's take a look. I've got a min-max thermometer in my greenhouse now. And uh, <laughs> 34 degrees in the greenhouse. So if it was 34 in here, you can only imagine how cold it got outside. Of course, this is currently unheated, but you might see something there. Not the final placement, but I do have a plan on how to get power in this greenhouse. So over here though, where we're actually going to be planting hardneck garlic, and the reason why we're planting hardneck garlic here is that this bed here, the entire surface level of the soil frosted over and actually formed a frozen crust. So I know that's a cold part of my garden and I know that means that it could also grow hardneck garlic really well, which thrives in the cold. So let's get started though over there, somewhere over there, over there, and chop and drop directly into a raised bed. I've been growing bush beans and also turnips in this bed for quite a while now and the bush beans actually produced really well. I actually have a very sad theory about the rest of my garden now, which you'll hear about more in a future update. But for now, what we're going to do is chop and drop everything in here and reset that bed for a future planting. And actually, a lot of these raised beds could use some of those starts that I showed you earlier. So without further ado, let's get into it. So here's the bed where I sowed all these carrots in my vlog where I didn't get any sleep. As you could see, they are germinating and some areas are just going to be a little bit thinner where maybe I didn't drop as many seeds or I just still had some incomplete germination. It's still possible. I took the chance of not watering because we were supposed to get a lot of rain, which ended up not happening. So <laughs> a little spottier than I'd like. But overall, every single row is actually fully up. And when these are grown, it'll be a lush carpet of green. So now we could get over here to the bed that we want to chop and drop. But first I got to pick all these beans. We'll eat them for dinner tonight and I'll show you guys the process for chopping and dropping in a raised bed, just like this. All right, so that's about all I could harvest from these. Some of them are actually a little bit big, but they don't feel spongy. Now, usually when it comes to green beans, once you start feeling the seed, they tend to not be as good. But honestly, I haven't really noticed that with um, these I think are the contender or provider bush beans. I'll put the link in the description when I actually check. But usually if the color seems like it's turned pale or if you grab it and it feels kind of squishy and hollow, that's a sign that it's probably past the eating prime for eating as a green bean. So what I've done here is I've pulled aside some of the plants that I already picked. Now what we need to do is go through these turnips here. I will be saving some of these for eating in salads, specifically the small ones. The larger ones, like this absolute unit over here, is actually still, oh, there's another bean. Still totally edible, but I prefer to give these to my chickens because they actually love eating these like big juicy globes of turnips. So some of these are gonna go chickens, the rest are gonna be chopped and dropped and the little guys like this are gonna go inside for dinner. So what I'm going to be doing now is separating the turnips and the greens. All the piles of greens here are what is going to be chopped up and added back into this bed. And you'll see exactly what that looks like in a moment here, once I finish harvesting all these turnips. The idea behind chopping and dropping is that you have a bunch of green matter, things that actually are full of nutrients that have been actually taken up from the soil. And rather than taking them and putting them in your compost to make compost or putting them in the green bin to literally throw away your nutrients, what you can do is actually return it back into the soil and actually improve the soil further. Because not only does this have the nutrients it collected from the soil, but it's full of organic matter that will help feed the soil bacteria, feed the worms, things like that, and add a wonderful texture to your soil, longer term nutrient storage and better water retention. So that's the goal behind chopping and dropping. You're building better soil long term. And it's just such a shame to waste something that's been collecting the sun's energy, your soil's energy for so long and putting it elsewhere. I'd rather return it back into the bed, especially since these are new beds that I fertilized when I planted them. So now that fertilizer has broken down, it's taken up into these plants and now I could cycle it back up to the top of the soil so that the next planting can use them almost right away, just like that. So I'm gonna go grab some tools and we'll get into this breakdown. If you're working with a small bed and don't have that much material to go through, you could of course just use a pair of hand pruners, just like this and go through and just start snipping it all into little bits. Now this is very time consuming and honestly, your hands will probably cramp up by the time you're actually making decent progress. The other option I've done in the past is using head shears, the big long basically loppers that could help chop up stuff really nicely. 
but ultimately I've always come to the solution of using a flathead or even rounded point shovel and just keeping it very sharp. So what I like to do is take a file and take a couple passes. Now, I'm gonna just caveat this and say that this is not the correct way of using a file, but I'm not sharpening a proper tool here. I'm just trying to put an edge on a shovel. It's gonna go into the dirt and get dull anyway. So I'm not really that worried and fussy about the technique. I just need to have a nice edge to cut up these plants. So all I'm going to do, the easiest, fastest way, is to just run your file up and down. This probably is killing some people who are machinists, but you know what guys, it's just a shovel going in the ground, so don't worry about it. Up and down while sweeping across, and that's giving me a lot of material removal here and putting a pretty dang decent edge on this. So the goal is that it should be sharp enough that if I take a leaf, it'll cut it right like that. So again, that's all we need. We don't need it to be a perfect chef's knife. We just need it to chop through plants. And that's exactly what we're doing here today. Another option is you could use a sanding bit that attaches to your drill that's like a pumice stone. That does really quick work as well, but honestly the hand file is not that fast. Once you get that initial edge, maintaining it is very simple. And also, just as a little pro tip, having a sharp shovel makes digging a lot easier. So what we're going to do, take that shovel and chop. Just like that, we are making quick work on these plants and the turnips. To take a look at that, that's pretty well broken up. If you go finer, it will break down faster, but this is pretty good for me. Now in the winter time, it does take longer for a chop and drop to break down in the soil. So I might go finer. I definitely have some bigger patches anyway. Just resurfacing all this stuff so that the big stuff ends up on top again. So let's go ahead and finish this up. And I'll show you what to do next. It's always amazing to me to see how a giant pile of stuff like that can be transformed into what's essentially just a surface mulch here. But as you can see, it's very well chopped up. At this point, I feel very satisfied that it'll break down fast enough. A couple of these bigger turnips here will take a little bit longer, but honestly, they'll probably become great little houses for microbes, the tritivores, things like that. So I'm not too worried about it. And of course, we will do an update on this bed in a week or two and see how much further it's gotten in terms of breaking down. Now, the next thing we need to do is take this debris pile that we've created and we're gonna just spread it evenly across the bed. Now you don't have to mix it into the soil. In fact, it'll probably work better if you just put it on the surface. Since I chopped it right in place here, I ended up working a lot of that soil in. Totally fine again, it should break down with no issue. So we've got it all spread. Now what I'm going to do is get a hose and we'll get this wetted down. Everything's been chopped, it's been dropped, which is the act of just leaving it on the surface and I've watered it in to provide plenty of water to assist in the breakdown. Now this is an optional step here, but what I like to do is sprinkle a little bit of compost over the top. The reason why I did this is because the compost is full of microbial life that will help break down this material even faster. The next thing I like to do is take a burlap or something like that and cover the surface of the soil. I am curious though to see how much of an impact this makes. So I'm gonna cover this half of the bed with the burlap and leave the other half uncovered and in a week or two, we'll come back and check and see just how much this is broken down. Now, the reason why I wanna wait before I plant in here is all this stuff breaking down requires a lot of energy, requires a lot of nutrients at the initial onset to break down. Once it's broken down, it will be net positive, but that initial period of breaking this material down will rob the nutrients from the young seedlings that I would put in here right now. So you don't wanna plant right away on a chop and drop unless you're using it as a surface mulch and not sort of mixing it in with compost and things like that. You can just leave it on the surface. It'll break down like straw or mulch or anything else. But in this case, I'm really trying to entirely break it down so I could have better soil and plants in here sooner. So I'm gonna cover half this bed and we'll check back on this in a week or two. Now let's get planting and I'll show you those frozen nasturtiums. They look quite pitiful right now. All right, so greenhouse is over here and this part of my yard is by far the coldest part of my entire yard. This is where all the frosts happen. They don't happen in the other garden across the other side there, but in this side, they definitely do. And it's actually for a very wide section. The first place I noticed it was right here in my pollinator patch, which actually this frost did me a great service because I have all these nasturtiums here that have been sort of volunteer and taking over. And this is what frost damage looks like. There's a more healthy leaf next to it there, but when they get all like dark green and wilted like that, that's because they froze and the cells literally burst. So that is now dead. And again, I actually wanted it in this case because I want this to be a straw flower patch again, not just a random nasturtium patch. Over here, similar story. I've already been ripping out a lot of this, but as you can see, it's all dead. It all got frosted over and that's totally fine. In this case, I wanted it 
This was the bed that had a full crust of frost here, right there, and that little wet patch was a little patch of ice. And, <laughs> hey Cosmo, you're famous now, everybody loves you. They said that you didn't break my cabbage, but I know you did it, don't worry. He's not in trouble, he's too cute. So over here, the four clocks, the four clock color blast, I should say, or I think the other name is like Marvel of Peru. They are also not frost sensitive, it turns out. The leaves are dead. Um, I have a couple bush, or sorry, pole beans that I put in, and, uh, yeah, they don't like the cold either. Now, one thing that was really cool is I built this cold frame here for an experiment for an upcoming video for you guys. And I just put it in the garden to get it out of my way. And I just plopped it down here. I was not thinking about the frost at all, but here's the really neat thing. If you look right here, there's an nasturtium on the outside of the cold frame. It's dead. It's wilted. It's fully mush and gross. But if you look just underneath, perfectly happy zero damage whatsoever on these nasturtiums. And the only difference is that it had a piece of wood and a piece of glass on top, nothing else. So at night, this just captures a teeny, teeny bit more heat than the surrounding area. And it doesn't let the cold air in to settle around it and kill the plants inside. So cold frames, very simple technology, but quite powerful. Now, if we take a look over here, I wanted to talk about this burgundy broccoli. If you only want a single type of broccoli and you want a lot of it, burgundy broccoli is the one for you. It actually does taste great. Now, like most plants that are purple, once you cook these, they will turn green and they'll just look like any other sprouting broccoli. But it is delicious and it is prolific. You could see how prolific it is because the broccoli is flowering even in the winter time. And guys, you could see that we're eating it. There is a lot of cuts on all these plants. Take a look at it. We've been harvesting nonstop. I've been giving away bouquets of broccoli to whoever comes at our house. And I mean, it's just incredible. It's one plant can produce as much as, I don't know, four or five, six traditional heading broccoli that I've grown before. Absolute stunner. Now I do prefer broccolini, which is my favorite, but this stuff, it is a sprouting broccoli. So it is a little bit more tender. It's not quite like the classic um, thick headed broccoli, which is not my personal favorite. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here is that this is the last of the, I believe, cheddar cauliflower I have. You can see it's quite small, and that's because the other ones grew faster and they overshadowed it. And the other one I wanna say was about three to four times the size of that guy. So very happy to start working out some of these plants and putting in new ones, because I have, as you guys saw, a whole lot of plants in the greenhouse. So let's go grab those and get planting. So Cosmo here is also somebody who loves the greenhouse. You know, he's a cold little dog. So let's let him in and take a look at these plants. <laughs> oh my God. Let's let him inside, he's too cold. All right, so what do we have to work with here? We have some Sweet Bunch broccolini, more of that. We also have Caraflex cabbage. That's one I've been wanting to grow for a long time. That's the one that makes a cone head. It's very cool. And as I mentioned, I have a much wider selection of uh, different nasturtiums here. So I'd much rather put these guys in than the basic orange one that you see all over the place. Actually, I just noticed I have some Cosmos. I have way too many things in here that really, really need to get planted out. So. Let's grab a tray and get popping in the garden. So what I'm going to do here is make a nice little selection of both flowers and of course also some vegetables. Now, as I mentioned, I love broccolini, so let's get that in there. It's also getting quite large. Now, one thing that I was pretty bad about on this cycle is planting these earlier. They do look really good, but things like brassicas can be time sensitive. And if you leave them in their pots for too long, even if they look good, when you put them in the ground, they might bolt or make their, you know, head of uh, cauliflower really early, but it's only gonna be this big instead of that giant head that you're looking for. So let's get all these bigger ones out of here because they really need to go in the ground. Oh man, I started some rutabaga. We'll see if that transplants well. I grew rutabaga once before and it was quite enjoyable. So I'm definitely willing to try it again. This is spigarello, which is a special type of broccoli that's bred to be eaten for its leaves. It makes these long blue twisted curly leaves and they saute up really nice. We had it in an Italian restaurant once, and um, you know, I'm a gardener, so as soon as I tried it, I knew I had to grow it myself. So we're also gonna grab a couple of these flowers here. I have the Orange Wonder Snapdragons from Botanical Interest. They have come up quite nicely here, so I'm very excited to see that. Like I said, I have those Cosmos. They're about to bloom, so let's grab one of those. And I'm also gonna grab maybe one or two of these different nasturtiums. Black Velvet is one that I've been very excited for makes these very, very dark, dramatic looking nasturtiums. Let's grab that. I already have a couple Alaska variegated in this side of the garden, so we'll try something different here. Looks like I have Fiesta Blend. I always like that. 
and I might as well grab a Zeolites Calendula. That is a absolutely beautiful Calendula. If you guys have only grown the standard Calendula, those are of course really, really quite pretty and useful in the garden, but the Zeolites are quite stunning. So I'm gonna grab those. And then lastly over here, we have the Silvery Rose straw flowers, and I wanna put those in that pollinator patch to start filling out my pollinator area again. Now, one thing I wanted to quickly mention is that in the past, I have struggled to grow Echinacea from seed, and there you guys go. The proof is there. It can happen. It does grow. So let's go ahead and get planting outside. Now we have a quick change of scenery here. We're on the other side of the garden, and I decided I want to put some of these plants on this side because it's going to be spring season soon. And I want to save that side for those plants because that side gets a lot more sun earlier in the day. So what I'm going to do here is just carve in some spots for all these lovely little plants. Now again, I have a mixture here. So the first one I wanna make sure I get into the ground is actually this broccolini, because I want that close to the door. Broccolini is something that you harvest more regularly than say something like a cabbage, which you harvest once when it's ready. So I'm going to go ahead and pop this broccolini in right over here. I'm gonna put it a little bit deeper than I used to, because it is a little bit stretched out after being in the greenhouse. And we're gonna go, I don't know, maybe a little bit looser than usual. I tend to crowd plants because I think I'm a little bit greedy when it comes to my garden space. So I'm gonna go ahead and space these out a little bit further than I'm used to, just to try to change things up a little bit here in the garden. It's one of those resolutions that I say every year, I'm gonna give my plants more space and I never do it. So that's gonna be good there. Now what I like to always do is make sure I include some flowers. So these nice, already tall Cosmos are gonna help fill in some of the spaces in between these plants. The first one that I'm going to be filling in is back here between my chard, where I actually, believe it or not, just pulled out a basil plant yesterday that um, was well past its prime. Now basil, while it doesn't just die here in the winter time, it does start to get disease and sort of fungal issues on the leaves, which isn't really great because with things like basil, you're of course trying to eat the leaves, not anything else. So fungus on the leaves, no good. Now let's go ahead and pop these last couple broccolinis on this other side. Here we are, this is a bed that I just recently flipped and actually it's a bed that was fully invaded with tree roots. I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about but I have these shrubs right over here by the driveway and this bed was underperforming for quite a while and when I started digging into it to investigate I discovered that it was absolutely full of roots even though there weren't that many plants in here. What I ultimately discovered was that when I dug a three foot trench in the ground there it was full of roots coming in under the driveway. So we'll talk about that in a moment. But first, let's get this filled with plants because it's begging for it. Now that I am confident that I fixed the soil up, I tore up all those roots, I dug a trench and killed all the roots on the end there, I feel pretty good that anything I put in here should have a good chance of surviving. So let's go ahead and go in with these cabbages. These are the new ones from Botanical Interest called the Caraflex. And um, I might try to be a little risky here and split up these seedlings because uh, some of them have two per hole. Let's see. The only reason it's risky is because these are quite large already and there's not that much soil. So you don't want to push it too far on something like this. But I feel like since it's winter time, things are growing slow, it might do just fine. Now with cabbages, again, you do want to space them out quite nicely. So I have them spaced on every two emitters. So from here to here is nine inches, the next one is nine. So that's 18 inch spacing per cabbage. What I'm going to do is also split rows. So instead of going directly next to it, like right here, I'm gonna go into this row back on this side. And in the middle, I'll probably put something like a flower to help fill in that spot, but I'm not gonna overcrowd it with things like cabbages, which are heavy feeders in general. Now, one thing that I've started doing this year that I haven't done in quite a while is been fermenting cabbages. So if you guys wanna see content on that, definitely let me know in the comments because I am very happy to do so. I've been eating a lot of fermented cabbage this year. I'm doing it the traditional Bulgarian way that I grew up eating with my parents. And uh, it's a little bit different than what most people experience. So I think you guys will find it interesting. And actually, now that I say it, I'll probably just go ahead and do it. But if you feel like I need the encouragement, definitely drop it in the comments and let me know if you guys want to see that. As you can see behind me, it's quite messy. I've been doing a lot around the yard here. In particular, there's a lot of branches from that shrub. That's the shrub that's been traveling under my driveway here. And I dug a literally two foot, literal two foot, deep trench all along here. There's roots all across it coming under the driveway. So by trimming it back, I hope to slow its growth down a little bit. And of course, I also cut out a lot of its roots there. 
Now on this very back section, where I'm not too worried about ever accessing or anything like that, I'm gonna go ahead and put a mixture of nasturtiums and calendulas to add some filler, some height, and some nice color to this back section. All right, it's starting to get dark and honestly a little bit too cold for a t-shirt, so I think we'll call it here today. Let me know if you guys enjoyed it, if you learned something along the way, and what you wanna see more of in the next video. I almost fell there, but thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.